everyone. In this video, we're going to talk a little bit about acid-base balance, and then we're going to focus most of our attention on some of the clinical findings that are associated with an acid-base problem or an acid-base imbalance in the body. So we know already that there are very specific parameters in which the body is able to function, and when we look at specifically the blood, we know that the blood has to have a pH between 7.35 and 7.45 to be happy, and any variation that's significantly outside of that range can cause some serious problems. We also know that the carbonic acid bicarbonate buffer system is one example of a buffer system that buffers the blood on a minute to minute basis. And we noticed already by looking at the respiratory section that there are specific things that we expect in terms of acid base changes, whether we're looking specifically at the area of the lungs and the blood that's perfusing the lungs, or we're looking at some of the peripheral tissues that are highly uh, metabolically active and that sort of thing. But when we look beyond the normal day-to-day -day functioning, it's important to think about what can happen if there's introduction of some type of disease or problem that truly threatens the stability of, of the blood pH or affects the buffer system in a way that makes it sort of behave differently than uh, how we would expect in a normal, normal functioning situation. We basically can consider acid-base problems or acid-base imbalances in four categories respiratory acidosis, respiratory alkalosis, metabolic acidosis, and metabolic alkalosis. So we note that two of these problems are respiratory based and two of them are metabolic based. Two of them are acidosis, meaning the pH of the blood has shifted below 7.35, and two of them are alkalosis based, which means that the pH of the blood has shifted above 7.45. So when we keep in mind these different diseases, we want to be able to differentiate what the origin of the problem was because that's going to help us understand whether it's a rest, we're going to classify it as respiratory or metabolic. And we have to know what the pH is so that we can classify it as acidosis or alkalosis. But unfortunately, unlike in clinical settings in the hospital where patients might have an arterial blood gas drawn, and we would have access to those lab values. In the field, we're not going to have access to any lab values, so we have to base our understanding of what's happening entirely on the patient's presentation and our knowledge of the carbonic acid bicarbonate buffer system. So as we look at acid-base balance in this context, we're really going to focus specifically on what we're able to observe in the field and not on any kind of numbers that would be available if we were looking at this in the hospital. So we're going to start with respiratory acidosis, and usually respiratory acidosis occurs as a result of some type of respiratory problem, such as apnea, hypoventilation, or respiratory failure. So we're talking about breathing that is too slow or not happening at all, uh, or just generally inadequate to have good oxygenation and then tissue perfusion. So if we're not ventilating well, one of the things that can happen is we can have an increase in CO2 retention or a decrease in CO2 exhalation. So we would expect that some of the CO2 that would normally be exhaled with a, with a normal ventilation is going to be sitting either in the alveoli, and then as a result of being, there being extra in the alveoli, we're reducing the gradient of movement of CO2 across the capillary endothelium into the alveoli. So that means that the CO2 in the blood will build as well. So when we look at the carbonic acid bicarbonate buffer system, we have to remember that we're specifically talking about what happens in the blood. And in this particular equation, I wrote it with the CO2 and the H2O first, but we could flip it around and write it the other way. It's an equilibrium reaction, so it doesn't really matter which order you write it in. I'm just writing it in this order because hopefully it'll make more sense and be easier to connect to the adjustments that we're making because of the patient's condition. So we know that in this case, we're gonna have an increase in the CO2, which is going to throw the reaction out of balance and it's going to drive the reaction to the right. So an increase in CO2 is going to increase the conversion of CO2 and water to carbonic acid, which in turn will increase the production of hydrogen ions and bicarb ions. And when we have an initial problem of an increase in CO2, the fix for that realistically is getting rid of the CO2. But in the meantime, because the blood is buffering the, the, the increase in CO2, because the carbonic acid bicarbonate buffer system is based on chemistry alone, what we're gonna find is that we have a decrease in blood pH as a result of 
the increased conversion of CO2 to hydrogen ions. And we know that we have a decrease in blood pH, of course, less than 7.35, our, our stable number. We're going to see things like protein denaturation. We'll de see some decreased oxygen binding to hemoglobin at the alveoli. We'll have more difficulty transporting the oxygen because of it. Um, and as I mentioned, the, the treatment for this problem is assisting ventilations with bag valve mask and or providing positive pressure ventilation, depending on what the patient can tolerate. And so when we correct the primary problem, which is what our target is going to be, when we correct the primary problem of improving ventilation, we're going to actually blow off the excess CO2. And so because we're going to reduce the amount of CO2 that's then in the alveoli and consequently in the in the bloodstream or at the you know the the pulmonary capillaries, we will be able to essentially reverse the effects of the 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 change of the carbonic acid bicarbonate buffer system. We'll convert the extra hydrogen ions back to CO2 and hopefully sort of come back to our baseline. So you know one of the things that we talk often about is things like respiratory and renal compensation, the role of the lungs and the kidneys to be able to assist in a situation where there's been an acid-base imbalance. But it's important to understand that respiratory compensation can't be applied to a respiratory problem. It can be applied to a metabolic problem, which I'll show in a little while, but it can't be applied to a respiratory problem because the respiratory is the primary issue or the, or the, the insult. All right, next let's compare respiratory acidosis to respiratory alkalosis. So respiratory alkalosis means that we would have uh, a, um, a primary respiratory problem and a shifting of the blood pH higher, greater than 7.45. The primary example that I'll provide for respiratory alkalosis would be hyperventilation syndrome. So hyperventilation syndrome being a, a true as uh, anxiety-based or uh, psychologically-based hyperventilation, panic attack type of thing. So the patient will be hyperventilating, breathing extremely fast. But remember that these patients also have good oxygenation. Um, they're not having a respiratory failure problem and and or a metabolic problem that explains their, their fast breathing. It's, it's purely a psychological issue. Because we're breathing so fast, we're exhaling extra CO2, which means we're essentially decreasing CO2 retention. Now, I could have written uh, increased uh, CO2 exhalation, but I didn't want to be confusing. I want to be able to show good opposites in this chart. So we're looking at it as opposite of what we saw with the, the respiratory acidosis findings. So the decrease in CO2 is actually going to pull the reaction in, in, in the direction of the CO2 to make more. So decreasing CO2 will actually cause uh, shifting more carbonic acid will dissociate into CO2 and H2O, which in turn means that more bicarb and hydrogen ions will combine to form the carbonic acid, which means it will have a decrease in hydrogen ion concentration or an increase in blood pH. So we know some things that go along with an increase in blood pH is decreased oxygen unloading. Um, so as we have a um, as we have an, an increase in pH, the oxygen will stay more bound to the hemoglobin and it'll be more difficult to take the oxygen off the hemoglobin and deliver it to the tissues. And then also one other thing that we notice with this increase in blood pH is increased plasma calcium binding. So in the blood, there is a certain amount of calcium or a certain percentage of calcium that is just considered unbound. The calcium ions are just floating and they're not connected to anything else. And when we have this shifting in pH, we're more likely to see that binding of calcium ions to some of the other um, ions or molecules that are present in the bloodstream. And this binding of calcium is actually what's responsible for carpopedal spasms. So the, the muscle contractions that we see, especially in the fingers and, the, and maybe the feet, um, these are things that are associated with this change in pH. And so the treatment for this is basically coach the patient's breathing. And of course, we have to be sure when we're saying coach breathing, this is the only instance really where we would be suggesting to help the patient slow their breathing down and be more controlled. And we really want to make sure that we're making this recommendation uh, when we know that there's not a, 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 a breathing problem or um, tachypnea because the patient is having a metabolic issue. So this patient will likely have a pulse ox of 100%. They'll probably have um, clear lung sounds and no other specific respiratory or metabolic issues that could be complicating the assessment.
Um, so when you coach a patient's breathing and help them slow their breathing down, we can um, have more CO2 retained in the um, in the alveoli and therefore in the pulmonary capillaries. And so we'll actually start to shift the reaction back in the opposite direction and restore our original resting CO2 concentrations and resting blood pH, which in turn will reverse the effects that we see with a hyperventilation. So we'll have better oxygen delivery to the peripheral tissues and we'll have uh, carpal beetle spasms will resolve. Next, let's talk about metabolic acidosis. So metabolic acidosis means that the primary problem is a metabolic problem, not a respiratory problem. So some examples of problems that are associated with metabolic acidosis include DKA, diabetic ketoacidosis, where we're producing lots of ketones, which are, are, are going to contribute hydrogen ions into the blood, lactic acidosis uh, or uh, sepsis, and lactic acidosis could result from other things, uh, but sepsis will be our best example. Uh, without getting into too much detail about the pathophysiology of sepsis, um, if we have um, any type of issue where we don't have good oxygen delivery and we're not able to efficiently make ATP, we're going to have um, a, a buildup of pyruvic acid, which um, we're just kind of getting stuck in the the, the cycle of um, we didn't get all the way to making the ATP, so we just have this like intermediate product and it can get converted to lactic acid, which circulates and releases hydrogen ions into the blood. Chronic renal failure, um, which really is more based on the inability of the kidneys to appropriately filter or eliminate the right amount of hydrogen ions or bicarb ions, in this case, probably not, re not releasing or, or eliminating enough hydrogen ions. And, um, and so therefore they're circulating. And then also aspirin overdose. So anything that is an acid-based uh, drug overdose uh, would be able to contribute increased hydrogen ions. So what we're finding is increased hydrogen ion availability or production in the blood. And this time I chose to write the reaction the opposite way. So it doesn't really matter again because it's an equilibrium reaction, but I think it's easier just to see the, the process here. So the increase in hydrogen ion concentration will trigger increased conversion or combining with the bicarb ions to make carbonic acid, which means we'll make more CO2 in water. And, you know, we can always have more water. That's not really a problem, but increasing the amount of CO2 in the blood is going to cause another set of events to happen. So the increase in CO2 triggers increased chemoreceptor firing. Um, so we have more uh, CO2 recognized by the central and peripheral chemoreceptors, which we know that those are going to travel via sensory neurons and, and communicate in the medulla, which in turn will have an increase in firing of motor commands from the medulla to trigger increased rate and depth of breathing. So what we're going to find is an increase in respiratory rate. So these are the patients who have respiratory compensation for their metabolic derangement and the respiratory compensation is tachypnea. So these patients do not need to have tachypnea corrected. In fact, the, uh, the, the presence of tachypnea is kind of what's preventing them from a total collapse because of the, it's helping to try and stabilize or normalize the blood pH as much as possible by converting more of the hydrogen ions to the, the CO2, which um, can be exhaled. So this is, um, this is probably the, the easiest example to understand in terms of the, 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 the body's response and the ability of the body to do something productive in the presence of potentially very serious illness. And, um, and so these are the patients that will be tachypnic, probably with cl clear lung sounds. If there's no other complicating medical issues, they may appear to be breathing a little heavy, but we can, if we take into consideration the full picture of the patient's problem, trace it back to metabolic acidosis. Um, as far as treatment is concerned, there's really no need for a treatment um, unless there's a uh, treatment that's, that belongs to each specific condition. So whatever the treatment would be for DKA, whatever the treatment would be for sepsis, you know, those things are, are going to stay. In this column, we're just keeping in mind interventions that may be appropriate for patients uh, to correct the specific metabolic derangement that we're looking at. Now, if we have an aspirin overdose, we could give the patient some bicarb. And if, um, if the patient has DKA and we're gonna be intubating them, then we may give them some bicarb as well. Because what can happen is if the patient is compensating by, with tachypnea and stabilizing their, 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 blo their blood pH 
by breathing fast, and then we decide to stop them from breathing in order to perform intubation, we've wiped out their entire compensatory mechanism. And because of this, we make it very difficult for the patient to be able to still overcome the metabolic derangement. So, um, so I'm not making any specific recommendations in this video, but, um, but uh, the, the recommendations that go with the medicine um, could include uh, treatment with bicarb for these instances. And the last type of acid-base problem that we want to look at is metabolic alkalosis. So I think that this one is the least likely for us to encounter in the pre-hospital setting, but may be associated with a lot of vomiting, severe vomiting, because we could be vomiting out all of the stomach acid or nasogastric suctioning. And there's some other examples as well, but I think these are the most likely to be connected to what we might encounter. So we could have a, a decrease in hydrogen ion concentration or an increase in bicarb concentration. And I'm just going to write it out for decrease in hydrogen, ions, uh, hydrogen ion concentration. So we can see again, and this sort of mimics what we saw with respiratory alkalosis. Now we're going to have a decrease in hydrogen ion concentration, which throws the reaction out of balance, but we're going to pull towards us. So we're going to increase the dissociation of the carbonic acid into bicarb ions and hydrogen ions, which in turn will increase the combination of CO2 and H2O to make carbonic acid, which in turn means that we're going to decrease our CO2. So a very extreme sequelae that could go with this. So this is this is probably the least likely out of everything that's up here. But if we think about it logically, the most extreme sequelae would be that we would have a decrease in CO2. And if we have decrease in CO2, we have decreased chemoreceptor firing. We'll have decreased um, motor commands from the medulla, which in turn could decrease our respiratory rate or our depth, and we could have hypoventilation. So if the patient presents with hypoventilation, we'll assess ventilations with a BVM, but um, it may be difficult to determine specifically metabolic alkalosis in this case if the only obvious presentation is hypoventilation. It would be important to consider the other elements of the differential that could cause the hypoventilation as well. So that basically wraps up our look at the acid-base problems or acid-base balance problems that we might encounter in the pre-hospital environment. And of course, if we think about in a clinical setting, there are lab values that we could understand and kind of correlate with these problems. But once again, because our patients don't come with lab values, we have to be able to assist the patient and keep in mind that these, these presentations might be either the primary problem the patient's experiencing or a major contributor to the patient's symptoms of their disease. So it's really, um, really meant for just kind of making a more well-rounded understanding of how the patient will deal with acid-based problems. So I hope you enjoyed it. Thanks for watching.